invite you to take something in your hands. The ring today. Okay, so just after a long day, um, just the invitation to let everything that has happened today pass through for a quick moment and uh, land here now in your body. And uh, just allow your mind just like to rumble as it wants to, nothing to shut down or to stop. Just let your thoughts be thoughts and just notice that you have them and they're all welcome. And everything that you're having on feelings, kind of stress or some frustration or joy or everything is welcome as well so nothing to change uh, just bring your attention just to your body and just see if you can just let go of holding patterns and so see what parts of your body you can relax even more shoulder jaw abdominal And bring your attention to your hands and to the object. And again, so the easiest step for the case you want to show that on one point to other people is including your mind. What's the label of the object? What are you using it for? What it's made for? So that your mind can be part of it. And then go a level deeper to the haptic. So there are different nerves for different sensations. Temperature density, is it smooth or rough, round or sharp, and while you're moving with your finger over the object, or with your hand over the object, or with the object over your hand, the key component is the slower you go, the more you will feel. And the formula that I like to use is slow down your speed by half and slow down your speed by half again. That allows a different part of your brain to engage with the sensation in your skin. So the invitation is just to explore a little bit different parts of your hands. And explore with eyes open or eyes closed as you like. And when you find a spot somewhere and it feels pleasant and maybe even pleasurable for you, then just stay there at this sensation.
you have some feelings or some resistance or maybe even memories or emotion coming up, just allow them all to be part of it. Just keep the movement going in your own speed that allows you to feel the sensation of pleasant or pleasure. The most important component here is it doesn't mean anything what you do there. It doesn't go anywhere. It has no goal. And when you narrow that down to that bare minimum, just recognize that you are in action towards a felt sense of pleasure. This tingular sensation there, this is caused by your choice. It's not doing anything to anybody, nobody's doing anything to you. It's just a pure action by choice towards a sensation that feels pleasant. And how long can you hold your intention on this sensation? And what happens when you do that?
Mm, you might have some thoughts coming in. How long is it going here today? Because I haven't said anything. So welcome these thoughts. Come for another minute or so. Slowly and gently bring the movement down to this. Stay there for a moment. Just notice what you notice in your body, in your feelings, emotions, in your mind. And your own speed, your own time your eyes, get oriented somewhere and bring your attention back to the screen. And again the invitation is to keep the object in the hand during this meeting today and um, anybody want to share change of state or a feeling or a thought that was coming up or an interference or whatever you notice is valuable all right wonderful um, so um, I have brought something today I want to share um, we can just see if that resonates so I would like to share today the difference between the um, uh, oxytocin pathway of that what we do that guides into a um, serotonin state of um, the nervous system that is more related to um, contentment or on the other side aside the um, dopamine related way of satisfaction that guides more into um, uh, satisfaction and wanting more <laughs> so this is something I could share a little bit more if you want that um, and then um, this what you just brought Nicola and um, Alex about polyamory one of my favorite themes so I can share a little bit more about that if you like or if you have anything else that you want to share and um, that was what I was picking up. Have you brought anything um, in specific? I just need to just like make a little kind of a curve about the story so that you get a little bit more context why this is important to me and why I have been kind of digging my fingers as deep into it as I possibly could into the nervous system and neurophysiology and kind of all this stuff and how that's working in the body and how it's, it's functioning. And um, so my journey about Tantra is almost 25 years old and it has been evolving and developing over the years. I have a certain direction with my work that calls somatic errors and I was looking into a dynamic that calls edging. I was looking over years into this dynamics of self-pleasure and masturbation in many people's behavior um, that most people live their sexuality or if they're self-pleasure or if they're in relationship whatever they do that sexuality has a beginning and has an end that is based on the procreative um, dynamic in the nervous system what is literally it's not an addiction but it's kind of created no let's say every addiction is a substitution of that yeah so so, so every addiction is based on the mother of all addictions what is literally procreation this is the, how the reward system is wired and the reward system 
works and that's why it feels so good so having sex and, and, and climaxing procreation so making babies is, is, is an addictive cycle in the reward center yeah. it's not an addictive cycle because addiction doesn't ex the word addiction doesn't exist that long that you can put procreation on top of addiction no no it's differently so addiction got created I don't know in the 60s or in the 70s as a term and um, everything that I was researching that's based on addiction is a substitution of this reward behavior many people mostly men I think it's about 80 percent or so are addicted to porn yeah, and then how have they actually worked in this dynamics uh, how is the brain operating how is the, uh, the the dopamine pathway literally creating this and um, how the visual stimuli through the eyes is bypassing everything below the neck that the entire somatic stimulation of the body so all these other pathways just not existing it just goes in here it just like goes straight in the brain and nothing else is happening so it's a, it's a pure visual dopamine pathway and one of the most important pieces that I came across then is that this terminology of edging has been guiding most people in a deeper level of addiction so that they thought okay so they don't um, when they masturbate they don't climax because climaxing has this big dopamine release they actually started watching pornography and were etching to pornography without climaxing what is actually creating even a, 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 a deeper and intense disturbance of the dopamine pathway so people who masturbate to porn um, in the old fat dynamic they just watch it they get turned on and then they have a climax after a few minutes and then they switch it off and it's a little bit like you know one porn you know every porn and the average that um, scientists were just like looking into uh, of when men as well women have started to engage in porn and and fab and, and and dynamic of sexuality and arousal that there was an average of starting sexual till the climax was 7.5 minutes on an average worldwide yeah. And when you just look in most pornography, so all the short clips and, and sexual engagement, you know, there's, there, there, there's, there's barely a clip that is longer than seven, eight minutes. <laughs> because when people masturbate or having sex, it just takes this, this is the, the average, that's the time. And then what it does is, and this is the term, if you know one porn, you know every porn, because it just like has created this dynamic. You know, it just starts with sexual arousal and it ends with a climax however that climax look, looks like but what they have found as well is when you have had a satisfactory pathway through pornography or, the, or a visual stimuli that people don't go back to this clip they don't go back to this very scene and that's what noveling came in so people started to novel on pornography and etching and created such an addictive state in their in their brain because they couldn't get rid of that so their entire social behavior completely changed <clears throat> so then I was looking up um, God, I don't know if the thing Huberman talked about that and there are other um, neurophysiologists around that so what is happening about the dopamine pathway is that when you get a dopamine pathway activated so that the dopamine um, neurotransmitter they are wired that way when you know when they when they connect yeah so it's an it's an um a, 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 a transmitter it's just like uh, uh, clicking in oh, sorry i just need to switch my camera off in a few seconds 20 percent left so when they're switching in they um activating the neighbor um, transmitter and they're getting activated as well so you need more and more stimuli to get the same amount of satisfaction therefore you just need to have more dopamine receptor fired and that means that's the reason why people getting kind of numb to certain um, substances as well to pornography and all that kind of stuff yeah. So that's, that's the reason um, what this pathway of dopamine is literally creating in the nervous system. Oh uh, my God, this is so good. How can I get more? 
Yeah. And then the, 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 the more on one level will not reach the same satisfaction, and then something comes in and that's boredom. Yeah, so, 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 so people who are not satisfied, they're, 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 they're bored. It's just like they need a kick, they need something else. And then I was looking into the other dynamic of edging when it comes to this pathway of that, what we're doing here with the hands, for example. And that is not the visuals, the visual pathway. It's the, it's the um, somatic pathway, so the inflow, the sensory pathway. And that is oxytocin based. It is not based on fantasies, it is not based on visual stimuli through watching something. It's based on feelings and emotions and sensations in the body. And what that does it, it of course there's dopamine part of that, but what that does is it activates the serotonin pathway of the nervous system. And the, uh, on the level of neurotransmitter, what serotonin uh, synapses do is they in, when they connect, not like dopamine, they fire the next um, a synapses around that. When they connect, they inhibit the next receptors. Yeah. So, and what that does in the body, it just creates a level of contentment and relaxation and ease, and says just like, "Oh my God, this is perfect as it is. I don't need anything else." Yeah. And that's the idea of. Um, sensual and relaxation based edging in this place is what creates literally a deep level of um, contentment and relaxation and even though I was researching that even deeper um, what the spiritual aspect of that is you know years ago in this tantric realm and how the release of DMT through melatonin and serotonin all that is released in the pineal gland and how this is firing up the cerebrospinal fluid and you know where the brain is swimming in and all that kind of stuff it's absolutely fascinating to see the difference <clears throat> and I talked about that I think on one point that you can measure the difference between a dopamine pathway and an serotonin pathway in people when they're coming in connection with the with the object that they say on one point, yeah, this is this is good, but what are we doing next? <laughs> yeah, and when they actually start feeling and just like, yeah, kind of, I, I like that, um, but I, I get bored. Yeah, or I I, I, need, I need something more. I, I need something. <clears throat> and what that does is the difference between the dopamine pathway and satisfaction and the oxytocin pathway or the serotonin pathway and contentment, there's a gap in between. And that gap in between, this is what is literally creating boredom because people who need to go down from their dopamine release into having enough of, of oxytocin and serotonin that they feel contentment, that needs time. And that's why the continuum of this practice is helping people to find deeper layers of relaxation because it creates new neurological pathways. So when you think in terms of um, uh, neuroplasticity, it just like rewires the brain and it rewires different pathways of the nervous system. And that's why this practice is so freeing. <laughs> okay, that was enough. That was a long talk. <laughs> Anything to ask at uh, uh, ask questions or whatever you have around that. So I have had my own addictive cycles in my life with coffee and alcohol and uh, smoking. I figured out that there is kind of steps in three that kind of works the best. This, you start with three days and then you go up to three weeks and then you go up to three months and somehow the dopamine pathway needs about three months to rewire but the idea around to reset this is not to go sober. So there is a saying that the opposite of addiction or a dopamine imbalance is not sorbity. The opposite of that is connection, what is the oxytocin pathway of connection, of feeling. So it's not like stopping something and then being on cold turkey. It's about knowing it will take up to three months, but you need something else that is not a substitution of the dopamine pathway. It needs connection, it needs physical proximity, it just needs feeling somebody and just like 
um, getting over that. There are a lot of great experience, uh, experiences around that with rats who have been put on heroin. I think sugar is a bitch. <laughs> And so, I mean, I think sugar was one of the hardest one actually to crack for me. And, uh, and uh, I started in the first place to replace refined sugar with, with um, a brown sugar and then with organic sugar and then with coconut sugar. And, um, and then it just it took, it took forever to get rid of that. Yeah. I just use a story around that sometimes. It's just like there, there's a there's a, a mother with his kid going to a guru and say just like, oh my god, my kid is sugar addicted. What can I do? And then the guru is sending the mother with the kid away, just like come back in three months. <laughs> After three months, the mom is with her kid coming back to the guru and say just like, okay, my kid is still addicted to sugar. What can I do? And then the guru said just like. It's, it's, it's possible to stop, this is what you need to do. And then she's totally annoyed, just like, why haven't you told me that when I was here in the first place? And then he said, I was not sugar addicted. It's just crazy, you know, some, I, I'm very clear with sugar, so I personally don't eat sugar. I mean, this sugar is in so many stuff, fruit sugar and all that stuff. And sometimes it's just you can't avoid it. So somebody has a birthday cake and, you know, it's just, and, or, and, and it's like, or somebody comes with a glass of, of, of champagne on a party or so, and just like, yeah, just have a little zip. But I feel completely dysregulated when I do it. To out myself with my addiction that I have uh, at the moment is peanut butter, you know. And I just love the crunchy peanut butter and I'm not putting it on bread or anything. I just take a spoon and then I just like really have a spoon of that. It's just like only one spoon. And I just notice that's like, okay, I observe myself going back with a spoon to the, sp to, the, to, the uh, to the fridge and just like, okay, just only one more. It's like, okay, sitting and doing something. Okay, just only one more. <laughs> Till the glass is gone, you know. I mean, what, what has helped me a lot with food, um, I, I did that. Uh, a few times, um, it's it's a German thing. I can't really translate that. But maybe you, Nicola and Alex, can help me. It calls the Sieben Tage Körnerkur, Se the seven day grain um, cure. So it's like you just use different grains and you just put them together with some vegetable and some um, kind of herbs, and it's, it's it tastes nothing. But what I got over is, is cravings that, that helped me a lot. So just like it just really killed the cravings. Some people do this candida thing. So kind of there's a, a certain um, candida in the belly that is just like going for the craving. Um, I have not done that. Um, but what has really helped me is, and I don't know how to say that in English because I learned it in German, is Trennkost. So, so, so where you separate uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. And the main thing is that you don't combine is carbohydrate and proteins. They are so good together. What they what they does is, when you eat them together, um, it's it's a certain I don't know the name of that enzyme, but there's an enzyme created in your belly that needs to kind of break it down. And this enzyme, when this is left in the belly, when everything is digested and goes into the intestine, this kind of creates this craving, this hunger for more. And I just noticed that how this has be kind of completely changing. Um, specific now I think specifically the de the dessert craving after eating a, a meal. And when that was gone, that was just like, oh my God, this is so liberating. <laughs> it's, <clears throat> so I, I, I guess there are so many different diets like different people and everybody needs to find their own kind of nutrition plan to just like break their habits and, 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 and cycles. And, uh, and I think this is, this is a science in itself that there are so many people that are much better than I can give any advices around that. But what I can say around that is to, to come back to this um, experiment that they did with rats is they were literally putting rats in an experiment. So if, if they don't have anything else um, or, or if they don't have any kind of other 
companions, then they're getting totally hooked on heroin in that water. Yeah, and, and this is just, yeah, they, they've just put heroin in the water and heroin in itself has this eff effect on the reward system. So it's completely dopamine related. And so they just put the same rats in other cages um, where they had um, companions where they could play and where they just like, were just like being in connection. And they put two different kinds of water in there, so real water and heroin water. And all the rats were avoiding the heroin water because the connection was more important than actually the heroin kick and the social engagement. So the social engage the social engagement and the dynamic of connection is oxytocin based. And and I, I, I love this this quote from so, so there's two quotes in combination that the opposite of addiction is not sorbity, it is connection, what is oxytocin based. And Buckminster Fuller has this amazing quote that I love to use. Uh, you don't change an existing system by fixing it, you create a new one that makes the old one obsolete. We cannot get addicted to oxytocin and serotonin because the, the addiction is digitally that we just need more input to get the um, uh, receptors fired. And when you have literally the serotonin pathways, they're just inhibiting the next. And th this was just like, oh, that makes totally sense to me. But you know, dopamine is not bad or dopamine is not wrong. It's just the right balance. And what's the, what's the behavior um, in the dynamic when this neurotransmitter are at play and uh, and I guess everybody needs to find their own formula of making it work. I, I believe that this is a serotonin pathway because there's no satisfaction. And it probably took me, I don't know, 12 years till I actually went over this. You know, I was, I was climax addicted when I was 11, I started. Yeah? And uh, you know, I've just spent my, from 11 till I was 29 or something like that, or 20, 28, where this was waking up in me. And then just like, whoa, what have I done? You know? But you know, my reward system and my pathway, they were just like all wired. You know, it took me ages to just like um, get over that and find different ways. I just said, Alex, it's true. So there is this slow sex movement that's getting bigger and bigger. So I think um, Diane Richardson kind of came up with that. And, uh, and um, what I what what I kind of try to understand is, and you know, I don't know if that's measurable. It maybe is. I have a question. Would you like to get a ten-minute my individual download about polyamory? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so first of all, I don't have any truth here. I have not the ultimate truth. I found my truth in that and that kind of resonates with me. And there are different ways of relating open and poly sensual and poly sexual and, and, and I just stick my nose as deep in till I was satisfied and got the answer for myself. And I see polyamory from a place of love based. Yeah. Um, when I say love based, I'm, I'm personally into um, being exclusive in my sexuality. Yeah. Exclusivity means I only have intercourse exchange of bodily fluids with one partner at a time. And when I see in being exclusive, that means that monogamy doesn't exist anymore for me because being monogam means I'm only with one partner from the first time to the rest of my life. This is the definition of monogamy. And so, and I imagine each one of us had already more than one partner in our life. Sexually with, that means we can't be monogamist anymore. One important piece of being exclusive with a partner means I had always this dynamic of I am committed to my partner. And I was never really understanding what I was committed to. Relationship, 
agreements or rules or any, I don't know. And then I figured out it's not about being committed to my partner, it's about being committed to my own values. And that shifted dramatically my relationship with my partner. I'm not committed to you, what you want. I'm committed to that, how I want to live my sexuality in my life. And I'm committed to my values that I'm exclusive and I just want to have sexual encounter with one person. But that does not mean that I want to be sensual or sexual with other people. And being sensual and sexual with other people, that's a complete different uh, uh, for me. So I'm making really sure that, and that has to do as well with my session work and engaging with people um, in, in a different way. <clears throat> so that um, I made that commitment to myself that I'm sexual or, or that I'm having sex only with my partner. But here comes one important piece in the, in the place because it's love based what I'm doing is that I want my partner to be happy and I hope that my partner wants me to be happy as well. Yeah? So if I want to be sensual or sexual with other people that I'm not doing that to destroy our relationship because I do that because sometimes I just feel it. You know, when I'm on a festival or when I'm on a workshop or when I'm, you know, maybe at a party. But I'm making sure if I'm engaging with another person, I don't have sex, I'm not exchanging bodily fluids. But that's not completely off the table. If I want to have sex with another person, before I have sex with another person, and that can be in a month, in two months, or in three months, or whatever, I want my partner, because I'm having a primal relationship with, this, with my partner, I want my partner to know that person I have this engagement with. And I want my partner to feel comfortable with somebody I'm engaging with. To turning that around, if my partner has another person my partner wants to engage with, I want my partner to be open to share that with me, that I have the chance as well to connect with that person. And not from a perspective of competition, from a perspective of just like, Oh, what is it that my partner is really interested in? So I just want to have a conversation with that person. I just want to want to know who do we letting into our dynamics. And that has made it made a complete shift and a complete difference, kind of having this yeah transparency and openness around that. That's a kind of a little bit of a rounding around that. Does it resonate? Intercourse. Yeah, intercourse means penis in vagina or anus or mouth or exchange of bodily fluids so semen fluid or vagina fluid or kind of blood or anything else around um, body fluids that can well with touch yeah so touch and hands but but not genital to genital contact even though if my partner feels like somebody else wants to get down on her um, I, I I am kind of okay with that, so so, so I, I couldn't find any trigger in there. So, but if my partner would go down on somebody else, then I have this is another um, yeah, uh, uh, hygienic kind of dynamic going on, and that, that is an interruption in my energy field. I, I feel like that that doesn't resonate with me. I don't want that. What, wait a second before I have intercourse and exchange of bodily fluids. If, if I play sensually or sexually, just like, you know, with clothes on, but, you know, getting hard and getting turned on, then I just play. And, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling obliged every, every time I play to just like include this person in my relationship. I'm not interested. Except if, if my partner would say, so did you have a good time last night? Yeah, I played with that person. So if my partner would just get ballistic and say, I just really want to meet that person. Who is it? It's like, yeah, okay, let's meet. But, you know, it's, it's not so important that I need to bring this person in our relationship and create any disturbance here because you're important. This person was just a play date or a play opportunity. But if you really want to meet that person, we can do that. But I don't have any intention to bring that person in because I'm not planning having sex with that person in the future. That would make a big difference.
Oh, it's a good. It's a good question. Sometimes it is, and it is, and sometimes it isn't. You know, for example, if I go to a party with my partner, or I'm going to a party, I have a conversation normally before. It's just like, okay, so what's on the menu today? What are we doing? What are we not doing? And so, so, so we really create the frame around it. And sometimes, just like there is no conversation, and then you are in an opportunity, and just like, yeah, I just, I, it doesn't mean that I have to go full force, but I, sometimes I just. I want to have proximity and I, want to, I just want to feel myself in connection with somebody else. That does not mean I just want to leave my partner, it does not mean I want to marry that person, it doesn't mean I just need to have sex now, but it's just like, no, it's just like I'm a sensual sexual being and I want to be in that freedom and I want my partner to be in that freedom as well. And I want to trust my partner and I want my, trust, my partner to trust me in this regard so that we actually have the same values so that we can go out and say, hey, I love you, just like have a good time. Yeah, it is, it is back what I wanted to say, just like the best thing to play on a party with somebody is play the three minute game. It's so much fun. <laughs> It's, it's, you, it's, you learn so much about that person. It's just like <laughs> what makes it kind of really work for me to relate is that, you know, you might have seen it somewhere, the, the four pillars of relating that I have created. So you find it in the book or there's as well this course. But the first pillar of relating is so important to me. And that's everything around self-care, self-love autonomy, my feelings, my thoughts, my body, my beliefs. And the main thing is the inflow. Yeah. So that I take full autonomy and ownership about my own domain. So my own base. And I have come to notice when people don't have their own base in place. So if they're leaking all over the show and projecting and having this kind of all your fold and, you know, it's just like you make me feel kind of this thing. So if they don't have their base in place or so this first pillar or the first layer, it's just like I can't bother to relate with somebody. So it's like I'm just, I'm just I can't. So I, I can have a conversation, but it's shallow as fuck. <laughs> people don't have that it's just like what are we talking about so um, if you want to look in the book in the four pillars so the first pillar is the cause or so if people when they have that in place okay we can have a conversation 